other things going through my mind this week. Things about church, our church, Christian churches everywhere, Bible, Christ professing churches everywhere, where are we at? Job 13, 3, the Bible says, Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. Then the great prophet Isaiah said, in Isaiah 1, 18, said, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, and although they be red, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Heavenly Father, Lord, let us uh, reason together with you, Lord, and uh, look at ourselves, look at the church, look at uh, your church, Lord, uh, worldwide, Lord, and where Christianity is and, and where it has been and where it's going, Lord. And we just pray for your grace, Father, that we might uh, toe the mark, Lord, uh, stick, uh, stick to the stuff and stay in your book, Lord, and, and uh, not let all the cares of this life and the things of this world draw us away uh, from that perfect uh, law. Uh, that you've given us, Father, and that law of liberty that whereby we can look to your grace, Lord, whenever we uh, fall away. Help us, Lord, to look at ourselves and let it start with us. Uh, look, pray that this church will be the pillar and ground of the truth, Father, and that we strive uh, to not uh, settle for anything less than that, Lord. And we'll thank you and praise you. Hold me up tonight by the power of your might. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, there comes a time, everyone's life, where you take stock, you look at yourselves. I've been uh, thinking about the ch church this week and uh, how we prepare for the future. Uh, every generation seems like uh, there becomes a greater falling of away. And, and when it talks about falling away, it's talking about God's church. It's not talking about the world, the lost world. There's, there, what are they falling away from? There's nothing to fall away from. They've already fallen away. But the church, the Lord said in the last days that the, there would be a falling away first before the Lord came back. And we're, we're seeing this uh, today. And uh, that don't mean that we have to be part of the falling away crowd. I've said, I've heard this somewhere and I believe it and I've said it myself that uh, every church is just one pastor away from apostasy. All it takes is just, just uh, one pastor to be gone and then, then a, a, a man comes in and before long you're, you're looking at four or five different Bible versions. Uh, there's no standard of authority. Uh, and, and things, uh, you always want to settle for something that God necessarily don't settle for. That's our way. If we allow the flesh to take over. Uh, we'll have problems. We see it worldwide. We see churches today that name the name of Jesus Christ doing a lot of things that God even calls abomination. Unless, and still churches, God's church, that call themselves Christian churches are indulging and embracing those things that God calls abomination. You can't do that. Somewhere along the line, there needs to be a remnant that stands for the word of God, that stands for the truth, and don't deviate from it. And from time to time, we need to look at ourselves. We need to look at ourselves. Our kids. Uh, we've got quite a few young people in church, and that's the life of this church for the future. And uh, I hear it over and over again from folks in their church that, well, we just, gotta, we just have a few. I remember uh, the judge over at Ripley County, he's retired now and gone, but he said, you know, I go to church and I... Pass your church and see all those cars and say, we've just got a handful. I've heard other folks say, we just got a handful of old folks. Old folks. And, and I've heard pastors tell me that some of the old folks in the church don't like to see the young folks in the church. They want to keep it just that little set little group of super spiritual folks. And you can't do that. You've got to bring them in. You've got to, uh, you've got to pass you got to pass the church on to the young folks. And uh, that's the future of the church. And with, without it, we've got a problem. Without it, the churches will die. Oh, there will still be a remnant. God will always have a remnant. 
The crowds may not be as big as they once was. But still, if you stick to the word of God, stick to the book, and allow God to give the increase, we'll be okay. We'll be okay with God. We'll have power in our prayer lives. And, and God will take care of us as a church. <clears throat> you got to get your kids in church. You say, well, pastor, uh, all I've got now is grandkids. Well, if, if you didn't make quite make it with your kids, you need to make it with your grandkids. I, I remember uh, all J- Jeff and, and Greg, all Jeff's family, uh, they went to church with my mom and dad. They'd pick them up, go to Hogan Hill Baptist Church. And you know what happened after that? Uh, the kids got mom and dad back in church. And then isn't that something how that happens? You can do that with your grandkids. If you'll work on getting those grandkids to church, uh, maybe they'll get your kids to church. So it's something you got to be aware of. The, the most uh, sad thing that I see is from generation to generation, you don't want, want to go to your grave knowing that your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren will end up lost. Without Christ and without God in this world, you, you've got to do what you can now to, to get those folks under the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. And not just some social, social mess where, they're, where it's, it's just a social event and, and, and kids stuff going on all the time that, that make the teenagers happy. You can't do that. You've got to stick to the book, stick to the, uh, uh, what was it that Porter Wagner had that song, The Cold Hard Facts of Life. The Cold Hard Facts of Life is that if they don't come to Jesus Christ, they're going to go to hell. And that's, a, that's the, the way it is. That's what the Bible says. So we need to do our best to, at, at least if you don't have, have kids that you can get in church, get those grandkids in church. Do what you can to do that. I remember when I was a boy, I think in Illinois, I remember on the, on the TV or around news time at night, I think the news would come on in Chicago around 10 o'clock. We were on central time up there. And a guy would come on and say, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? My, my, my. It's getting late, folks. Do you know where your children are? Do you know where they are with God? Maybe you need to work through the grandchildren to get to the children. Because here's what happens. See, if that generation is not in church, or just come, uh, say, Easter Sunday and, and, and Christmas, and those times, vacation Bible is the only time they come. You know what their generation is going to be? The next generation, it's going to get less and less as far as the importance and the significance of God and Jesus Christ and church in their lives. And I'm talking about the church because the Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. And I'm pretty rough on the religious crowd. I'm, I'm always talking about uh, it was the religious crowd that crucified Christ. It wasn't the guys down at the bar. And that, that's the truth of the matter. But don't get me wrong. The Lord loved the church and gave himself for it. He just wants a church that is Christ-like, not a church that is world-like and churchy. Somebody said that the world gets more churchy and the church gets more worldly. And that's kind of where we're at. And the Bible said that's how it would be in the latter days. That the folks would depart from the faith. Giving ears to seducing uh, spirits and all kinds of oddball doctrines. And you get your kids outside of, of, of the preaching and teaching of the word of God. They'll be carried about, the Bible says, by every wind of doctrine. God established the church with pastors and teachers and, and those types of things for the perfecting of the saints. And God, the Lord loved the church, gave himself for it. But there's a, a big crowd out there of folks who mom and dad, whose mom and dad was in church. But they gave it up. They've strayed from it. They've departed from the things that they were taught as kids. I've dealt with a lot of people uh, as a policeman who have never made God uh, any part of their lives. And, you know, you find the, the most interesting thing, if a plane, if they find out a plane's going to crash or somebody's got something about to happen, immediately happen to them, you know what they do? Even an atheist will say, oh, God, why do they do that? They've denied, denied God throughout their uh, many uh, years of their life. But, 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 boy, when it comes down to, to something, uh, some emergency happening, it's, oh, God. 
Why not have him in your life every day? Get your kids to depend on him, to trust him, to pray to him, to ask and receive. John R. Rice wrote a great book on prayer, and, and the, the basis of his book is this thing about asking and receiving from God. And he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. He, says, he said, I will give you rest. Man, it was a tough night for me the other night. This, this fella, uh, I think 60 years old, uh, killed on, on one of those ATVs, went around that curve just this side of one on North Dearborn Road and hit a tree, dead instantly. I had his phone in my hand from the accident scene and folks started calling that phone. It can happen just that quick in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, boy, that life can be snuffed away. Your kids, you don't know what's going to happen with your kids. You need to make preparation for that. We need to make preparation as a church to welcome young folks into our church and, and uh, uh, compel them to come in. We need to come up with things that will get them in. in not not uh, crazy, stupid things, not worldly things, carnal things, but make it interesting for them to come. Bible says compel them to come in that my house might be full, may be full. In other places it says to provoke unto good works. I don't care if we've got to give them hot dogs on Sunday morning if it gets them here. And you can't judge them until they trust Christ because a lost person don't know any better. They're going to, they're going to want to do this and want to do that and you don't go there with them but you, you got to work with them and let them see the power of God and see the joy of God's people and, and let those people who are saved deal with them. I remember when I got saved, you know what I wanted to do as a, as a boy when I got saved? I wanted to tell my friends that I got saved and that I trusted Jesus Christ. I'll have to say some of that waned over the years. But do you remember when you first got saved, how you just wanted people to know how excited you were and how good you felt about it and that peace that God gave you about salvation? If we don't reach this generation, then the following generation, there's no hope for them. Look at the, uh, uh, the, the small children in our church. What's their children going to be like? That depends on what they're taught. If they're taught the church is an important part of life, then that's what God respects and God wants and God expects it out of his people. God did not expect want or expect the world to raise his children. See, your children are in heritage of the Lord, the Bible says. And the world today, um, most of the world does not want to hear about God. That group is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, in Psalm 10, 4, the Bible says, the wicked through the pride of its countenance will not seek after God. They don't want to hear about God. That far left liberal crowd that pushes all those abominable things, <coughs> the champion abortion and all those abominable things of God, they don't want to hear about God. Proverbs 30, 12 says, There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. They're standing up for things that are against God. We can't do that. We've got to stand with God. If God's against it, we need to be against it. And we need to be against it in a loving way. We've got to reach out with, with the love and the tenderness and the charity and the kindness of God. And uh, Romans 1.28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Isn't that where we're at? They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They don't want some athlete after a winning touchdown to give praise to God or thank Jesus Christ. It embarrasses the news media when one of those athletes starts giving glory to God. They don't know how to get that microphone or camera away from them. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. My, my, my. To do those things which are not convenient. I don't want, I, I don't want uh, someone to get turned over by God to a reprobate mind. It seems there's a generation that the, world, the devil's working on to try to get them to turn against everything that is holy and right and pure and godly. Romans 3.18 says there is no fear of God in their eyes. That's what we're up against as a church. We've got to understand that. 
Got to be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. Time and time again, I've dealt with those who have, have never experienced this thing of God in their lives where they can call on him and he answers prayer and he comforts them and holds them in his arms and lets them know that everything's going to be all right. There are those who pre- profess the name of Christ but refuse to allow him to direct their lives. Watch out for that. Why, why, why would we do that? We profess Christ. Yes, we're Christians. But when it comes to doing what the Lord asks us to do or commands us to do, we refuse to do it. We've got a mind of our own. We've seen it happen in our public schools. Uh, there's a, a national curriculum sent down by the National Education Association that is uh, made up of, of ungodly uh, PhDs who don't want anything to do with God and they push everything down uh, through the federal money over the years. If you don't follow that federal curriculum, then you're not going to get the federal dollars. And that's why our public schools have turned out killers because they've kicked God out of the school. They've expelled him from the school, from the public forum, from everywhere. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. My, my, my. Timothy 1.16 says they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. I, it seems like <clears throat> just about everything today is about material things. Uh, Matthew 6, 24, the Lord said this. He said, no man can serve two masters. It can't, it can't be about God and also be about material things. You can't, you can't hold them at the same level. You've got to trust God and he'll give you provision. You work hard, uh, God will give you provision. He may even give you wealth and riches. That's okay. God will do that. If you've got a mind and a back to work, you do it and, and let God bless you. Nothing wrong with that. But you can't put your trust and your hopes on that stuff that you have acquired. I've got a bunch of stuff at my house. I can't even go through my wife's stuff, let alone my stuff. Got stuff everywhere. My, you can't serve two masters, the Lord said, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, material things. Who is your master? What are we serving? Who are we serving? What do you want for your kids tonight? What do you want? For your grandkids. Moses said he would rather suffer affliction. Rather suffer affliction. uh, With the people of God. Than to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He made a choice. He had it all in front of him. Mm. That song we sang tonight. From Mark 8.36. Mark 8.36. The Lord said for what shall it profit a man. If he shall gain the whole world. And lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Man, you can be the CEO of every Fortune 500 company in America and still never find the peace or the joy that a saved working man can find. My, my, my. Education without salvation is damnation. Somebody uh, quoted that the other night and I think they said it came maybe from Bob Jones Sr., I remember hearing that on the radio when I was a boy. Somebody, some preacher saying that. Luke 12, 20, but God said unto him, Remember the guy who stored up all, filled all his barns up with riches? And, and they said, well, what are you going to do now? You don't have any room left. He said, I'll build bigger barns, more barns. More, better, bigger. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Man, I pity somebody having to go through all my junk. Most of it isn't worth throwing away. Oh well. But we'll, you know, today we'll look at some poor working man and think, man, that, that fellow really has, has it rough. And that fellow may sleep twice as good as you or I do. It's as rough as you think it is. In reality, that fellow comes home at night to a wife and kids that love him. 
able to pay his bills, and he's probably twice as happy as most of those CEOs are of their companies. Mm. Look at the suicide rate, rate against the rich and famous. Wow. No social barriers when it comes to I'm fed up with it all. I can't take it anymore. That crosses all the barriers and all the lines. Riches are, are as much a curse as a blessing. What's the, I forget where the verses are. It says, give me neither riches nor profit. Poverty. Don't give me riches so I'm lifted up and forget God. Don't give me poverty so I don't curse God. That's a pretty good saying. And the Bible says also to, that we need to learn to be content with such things as we have. It says contentment with godliness is great gain. Ecclesiastes 5.12 says the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Whether he eat little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Stay up late, stay up all night long. Worried about somebody getting what he's worked to, to get. Worried about losing somebody getting a hundred dollars off of him. Mm. King David had seen it all. You know what David had to say about it? He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Wow. And man, he had, he had it all. It's, you know, and it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of it. Abraham was a wealthy man. A lot of those folks in the Old Testament were wealthy people. Nothing wrong with that. It's the love of it that is the great destroyer. And you know, it's my understanding, and it makes sense to me, that verse that, that says uh, that it's, it'd be easier for, for a rich man to go through the eye, a camel to go through the eye of a, a needle than, than a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. It's my understanding that's a tribulation passage. Because in order to get rich during the tribulation period, you had to receive the mark of the beast and the number of his name. If you didn't do that, you couldn't do commerce. You couldn't do business. Isn't that interesting? Thought I'd throw that in, a little doctrinal point there tonight. Martha Stewart, look at her. Boy, she had it all. She's making a comeback, I understand. Somebody said she was on TV again making a comeback. Money, fame, everything the world had to offer. But she has lifted up in pride, I think, what got her to begin with. and A bunch of political foolishness against her. Bible says pride. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God's not interested in how important we think we are. And see, if we, once we come down off our high horse, then we'll start looking at the serious... We'll start to reason with God and get serious about our families and the next generation. There comes a point in your life you've got children. You start thinking about them and what are you going to provide for them. And the greatest thing you could ever provide for your kids was a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Teaching the importance of being in church. And, and if, if you don't like the church right, find one that, that preaches the book. Believes the book and don't stray from it. Don't take away from it or add to it. Get them in church. Let them know the importance of it. It's your, it's your duty before God to do that. Command. Uh, it talked about Moses. Said he would Abraham would command his children after him. But then the Bible talks. There was a generation that came after that fella. Who knew not the Lord? Remember all those kings. You'd have wicked kings and you have a good king. And then there'd come a generation that knew not the Lord. Things that go downhill. Don't let your children be that generation. Don't let your grandchildren be that generation. Get them in church. Get them in the book. Show them the importance. You know, we'll go to great lengths and do great research on buying a new car. But when it comes to the things of God, it's just like, like they're put on the back burner. We've got, to, we've, we've got to treat it with the respect and importance that it needs to be treated with. My, my, my. 
Christ died for all of us. He died for me. I'm thankful for that. Why the Lord would love me. It was a Job said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What is man that thou visitest him? But that's God. God loves us enough. He wants what's best for us. And I'm, I'm sure you, you remember in the children of Israel and, and, and the, the Lord's explaining some commandments to them. I think that's the context. And it says in time past, God winked at some things. Because of the hardness of their heart, God knew that they could, couldn't handle much more than he gave them. And he kind of let some things slide. I wonder if today when God sees his, the Lord's church, the church that named the name of Jesus Christ... They got saved, they got scripturally saved, born again. They're not going to hell. But when it comes to doing the work, to finishing his father's work, to finishing his work, to, to being a witness, a light for the rest of a dark world, I'm wondering if God, and more than winks, he just shakes his head. If the Lord just shakes his head at what he sees his church becoming. And I know nothing catches him by surprise. He foretold it. In his word of the falling away in the last days. And that's what the church has done. But it's up to you to not let it be you. Not let it to be your generation. And, and, and to welcome young folks into church. Don't expect too much out of them until they get saved. They don't know any better. A, a lost man can only relate to the things of the flesh. He can't relate to spiritual things until he trusts Christ and gets indwelt with that spirit. But God's going to always have a remnant. Pray that your children and your grandchildren will be a part of that remnant that still loves Him, still serves Him, still wants to do what God wants them to do. Be careful as, as a, the, the church transitions. I don't know how long I'll be here. I may not live another 40 years. But there may be a good looking woman walk in here and out the door I go. Lost another preacher. Boy, it wouldn't take her long to get rid of me. But you don't know, but you've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared to keep the church going and keep it, keep it uh, circumspect with that word of God. That's our authority. Whenever we deviate from it and fall from it, we're just asking for trouble. We want our prayer life to be strong. We want to put up, uh, put up those prayer chains and prayer requests. And we want God to respond. Because that's my church. That's those people who want to do it my way. Who haven't deviated from my word. Who have stuck to the word. Man, the Lord, uh, he wants to show himself strong. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth that he might show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect toward him. The, the Bible says uh, that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He wants to reward you. He wants to show himself strong in your behalf. We can't let it slip. We can't let the world sneak in. Man, you, you, you see the craziness of this world today, the, the teenage craziness. I mean, back, back the, the dances we did as a, a kid, some thought it was vulgar. But man, that stuff that's going on today, it's just pure vulgarity. Some of it's crazy. You've got to pay attention, Mom and Dad, Grandma and Grandpa. And, and, and uh, the best you can do is get them to that saving knowledge. You get them saved. And then, then it'll be uh, between them and God. God will deal with their hearts. And try to get them in church. A Bible believing. Bible preaching. Bible teaching. Bible loving. Church. It's up to us. What this church becomes is up to the, you. This is our Wednesday night crowd. This is, is normally the strength of the church. It's up to you. What becomes of this church down the road. Ten years from now. 15, 20 years from now. Hopefully the Lord comes tonight. But we never know. We have to keep in the battle. Keep fighting. Keep in the fight. Where are you tonight with your kids and grandkids? Are you trying?
Have you made a call and said, why don't, why don't you let me pick up those grandkids and take them to church Sunday? It's some things you'll never regret. And that's important. I'll always be thankful. Reverend Cavanaugh, Brother Cavanaugh over at Hogan Hill Baptist, so many of my family went over there and, and kids that found Jesus Christ through that little church at Hogan Hill. Thank Lord. He'll do that with your kids and with your grandkids if, if you'll let him. You got to got to jump in there and 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 ask God for guidance how to get them in. A lot of them don't want to come. I didn't want to come when I was a kid. My mama made me come. Shame on her. <laughs> get them in. Bring them in. I'm done. Jeff, you'll come. We'll get a song of invitation. I didn't know it was that late. I would have quit sooner. <clears throat> no, God is good. Everyone stand up tonight, take a songbook, and we'll sing a verse of a song of invitation. Pray for our school kids this year that God will make a way for next year. We'll see how that goes. All the folks that put their labors into that. Pray for our young people. Pray that God makes a way. What page, Jeff? <clears throat>